Okay, so my name is Tamsin Mather, and I'll be speaking about volcanoes and the clues they can give us to a, the, the enigmatic earth beneath our feet uh, and enigmas about deep time and extinction events and how biology came to be how it is today. So welcome to the seventh Darwin College lecture in this series on enigmas. Last week, we heard the fascinating account of a forensic investigation of the pre-modern book. So books, British literature, begins almost with the Altus Prasata, a sixth century poem about the natural world attributed to St. Columba. The place where sulfur burns with devouring flames the place where from the fire comes a horrible hunger, plenty of weeping and gnashing of teeth, a volcano. That was poetry. Move forward to the seventh century, a library in the Jarrow Monastery where Bede lived. That library had a copy of a science book, Pliny's Natural History. Now Pliny was an expert on volcanoes so much so that violent eruptions with giant columns of ash and fire are termed Plinian. Not a safe study topic for him, though. He died saving, pe saving people as Vesuvius erupted in AD 79. So being fascinated by volcanoes is, is ancient, but clearly not a discipline given to health and safety, at least then. To quote Pliny's nephew, Pliny the Younger, he said, like a true scholar, my uncle saw at once that it, the eruption, deserved for closer study and ordered a boat to be prepared. He said that I could go with him, but I chose to continue my studies. Very wise, he, he survived. So modern earth science really springs from those Roman roots. In 1828, Sir Charles Lyell visited Pozzuoli on the other side of the, uh, of the Bay of Naples from Ves Vesuvius. And Pozzuoli is the place where St. Paul landed en route to Rome. He could even have met Pliny. Lyell noticed that the holes in Roman columns, huge Roman columns, had holes in. They were made by marine bivalves. And so Lyell realized that over 2,000 years, the land had fallen and risen by meters. That origin was volcanic. He was standing on a huge magma chamber that inflated and deflated. And his work triggered Charles Darwin's interest, and even for us, it illustrates the impact of changes in relative levels of, of sea and land. Now, volcanoes are a, still a, a hot topic. I mean, I'm a geophysicist. Uh, schools have most often asked me when also invited me to come and talk, to talk about earthquakes, volcanoes, and plate tectonics. Well, they all feature in the GCE, GCSE geography curriculum. But primary school children are really, really fascinated by volcanoes too. All that hot lava bursting out and clouds of ash and steam. Of course, it's not all like that, but that's what's exciting. Now, tonight we have someone who's got that bold sp spirit of Pliny the Elder, someone who sits on the edge of volcanoes. So please welcome Dr. Tamsin Mather from the University of Oxford, who's going to speak on eruptions, emissions, and enigmas from fuming volcanic vents to mass extinction events. Tamsin. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for coming out on such a wet and horrible day um, to come and hear about something hopefully a little bit warmer and more exciting. Um, it's always a pleasure to come back to Cambridge. I spent many of my formative years here as a student, so it's always a delight to be back. Um, and I'm going to share, actually, a couple of my personal enig enigmas with you today. Uh, and these are enigmas, both of which have roots in my time here in Cambridge. And I'm particularly happy to be talking, giving a Darwin lecture um, on this uh, particular topic for reasons that will become apparent later on. 
Well, I wanted to start off with this photo. This photo is uh, of the Ayafat Yerkut eruption in 2010. And I like to start with it because it reminds us all that volcanoes, even in this sort of tectonic backwater that we, uh, we inhabit here in the southeast of the UK, can impact on our daily lives. So, of course, I, I put money on someone in this room, probably uh, many, many people in this room having been impacted by this volcano here and the closure of airspace in 2010. Um, I think this photo itself is very enigmatic. We have this, uh, this dark column of volcanic ash, which have caused all the problems, this, uh, this, this, this hot stuff, this lava going on here, and then this bolt of volcanic lightning as well, uh, which, is, which is generated by the volcano, but it kind of looks biblical in its, in its expanse. Um, and, of course, this answers to enigmas, first of all, the enigmatic pronunciation of the word Ayafat the uh, that floored many, many new newscasters uh, over the, the crisis. So if you have a moment and are so inclined, do go and look. There's a wonderful YouTube compilation of all of them trying to say this word. It uh, really does pass the, the, the dull winter evenings. Uh, and uh, just imagine if you're used to reading things off your teleprompt and suddenly this word uh, comes up. Some of them have true fear in their eyes. It's, uh, it's, it's beautiful to watch. And they kind of settled into a pattern where they actually caught, they ended up just calling it the Icelandic volcano, which, uh, as a volcanologist, is deeply irritating because Iceland has huge numbers of volcanoes, and this is just one of them. Um, so that's uh, one of the enigmas here. Um, but, but also it kind of summarizes for me some of the awe that we feel uh, when, we, when we see a volcano. And it also answers the enigmatic question of how can we make a volcanic plume look more exciting? And of course, that's putting a lightning bolt in it like this. Uh, and volcanic lightning is actually one of my particular interests. Uh, this is one of my favorite photos. Um, but I want to start off with two enigmas, as I said, that kind of linked together and started off uh, very much during my time here in Cambridge. So this is me just, this is my first field work that I did as a PhD student. Um, back in, to, starting in 2001. Um, and this is me on the crater rim of Messiah Volcano in Nicaragua. So many of you might find this photo vaguely scary because you can see this massive crater here behind me and this fume of gas coming up here. I actually find it terrifying for another reason. It's how young I look. Um, but here I am actually, uh, I am paying attention to some health and safety here with my helmet uh, and my gas mark. And here I am with all my different pieces of equipment some of which I will describe later on in the talk, uh, basically monitoring uh, or, or measuring what's coming out of the volcano. So as I said, this was the first term of my PhD here in, uh, in Cambridge, uh, and I'd flown over to Nicaragua, to Marsaya Volcano, that's uh, in this location here in Nicaragua. And we'd had a really troublesome journey. We'd lost luggage, most of the equipment, in fact, all my colleagues' clothes. Um, we got to the hotel. We got lost on the way to the, from the airport. It's my first time in Latin America. Um, and we, we got lost, um, and we'd eventually arrived at the hotel extremely late. Um, and I woke up with the sunlight coming through those sort of wood slats in this room uh, with termites, the sound of termites eating them, and I opened the door, and this was the view that I got. So you can see the sort of jungle here, and then this is Messiah Volcano up at the top there. So it's a pretty low-altitude volcano. It's only about 600 metres above sea level, um, and this uh, makes it very, very good to work on. Some, some of my colleagues call it a, a drive-through volcano. You can drive your equipment right up to the crater rim there and run your experiments. I don't much like that term. It kind of makes it sound like a Starbucks or a McDonald's or something, and it's, uh, that's not very much work, the, the, the emotional space it inhabits for me. Uh, but I'd woken up, this was my first time, my first adventure on a volcano, and it was quite an astonishing start, start to things. Um, and this is, what we, this is what I was able to see as I peered over into, into the crater here. Um, and you can see the gas coming out of these two, these two vents that we had in those days. Uh, and this glass, that gas, an aerosol plume, wafting up with particles. And I was sort of staring into the mouth. My machinery was running in the background. And I was sort of wondering at the aura, if the wind dropped a little bit, you'd be able to hear the magma down in, within the vents here, sloshing around, roaring, in fact. Um, and you could obviously see, see and smell the gas coming out of the volcano like that. So, uh, so this was, you know, I was appearing in, and it's very enigmatic. You're seeing all this material coming out, but what's going on down in that vent? Um, 
as you can see, I was very excited and some of the time got uh, very, uh, actually got very relaxed with my new habitat. Uh, and this is a photo that one of my colleagues took at me hard at work. Obviously, all my pumps are running. I've just been lulled into a, a sense of sleep. But I, you'll be pleased to see I'm still wearing my gas mask and my helmet, so thoroughly prepared for all eventuality uh, and clasping my all-precious field notes there. Um, but the interesting thing, I've been back to Nicaragua a number of times over the years, and actually, through various rock falls and things like that, um, the volcano, what's actually going on in the top of that conduit, as we call it, that event has revealed itself. So I just wanted to share this video that one of my colleagues took back in 2017 when we were there, just to give you an idea of what was hidden down that vent. So you can see the magma sloshing around. It almost looks like a, a fiery ocean, doesn't it, here, with the gas, the gas uh, whooshing out. Um, and these hotter bits coming out and then sinking down. Uh, you can see how energetic it is. You can hear that roaring noise that I was referring to. And that's what I've been measuring all these years. So it was only 2017 that we, we saw this for the first time. So this was actually taken in April 2017. I'd seen this footage. My colleague Emma Liu, who was also uh, a PhD student in Cambridge, had shown me. And I was extremely excited about my trip there in November 2017 to see this. And as I said, I'd never actually seen what was going on at the top of this magma conduit. I arrived a little later than um, many of my colleagues in the field, and they decided they'd have a joke. They decided they'd tell me that the lava lake had drained um, and we could no longer see this because they knew how excited I was about seeing it. And I was completely taken in. I was taken into the fact when we were going up, driving up in the evening, I could see this glow in the distance. I was going, oh, there's a lot of crater glow, isn't there, given the lava lake's gone away. And they're all going, yes, there's a lot of crater glow, isn't there? Yes. And we got up to the top, and I was uh, both angry and delighted to find that we could still see this. So in a way, what we're doing in here is peering into um, messages from the inner workings of our planet. And it's very enigmatic. It's... One of the things that really fascinates me about Earth sciences is we stand on the surface of our planet. Uh, and if you, if you stand like this, sometimes it gives me vertigo, but you can think that below you is the, is the core of the Earth. Uh, we can empathize more about walking on the surface of Mars than we can really about what's going on in the inner workings of our planet. And volcanoes are sort of one of the ways that we get messages about what's going on and how our planet's interior is working. So that's one of the enigmas that's really kind of been fascinating me over, uh, over my career since starting my PhD. And of course, uh, one of the reasons that we're motivated by that is very human, very, very uh, on our human timescale. So um, I, I put up this, uh, this, there was actually a lot of volcanic activity uh, over the last few months, including the fatal eruption on White Island, New Zealand. But I put up this, this, uh, this, this uh, news coverage of the Taal volcano in the Philippines just to remind about, like, thousands of people were evacuated. And if this had gone, it's calmed down now, but if this had gone off, then it could have really impacted the much larger population here around Metro Manila in the Philippines. So you can see that there were, there were, millions, of, there were millions of people within these different zones here. Uh, once we get into Metro Manila. And you can see there's about seven of them here in the foreground, actually looking like they're having rather a jolly time in front of this rather ominous-looking eruption column here. Um, and then this person uh, clearing their car off here from, from the ashfall, which looks a little bit like snowfall. And actually, I was going to make a point about the fact that the press has moved on, and especially it seems like a long time ago, now that we're all very much more worried about a certain virus that is spreading around the world. But, uh, but, but actually, there's a, a really nice video, a very moving video, that was just on the BBC website this morning, where they've gone back to the island here, where they were all evacuated from. Um, and uh, they're searching for their lost relatives and lost pets and things like that. So actually, I was very impressed by that because I, I sort of felt that the, the journalists had gone back in to record the aftermath of this sort of disaster rather than having moved on. But I'm not going to talk about volcanoes as hazards today. I want to take a different tack on things. So we do, we do work on things to do with this. But actually, I wanted to talk about another enigma that, for me, in a way, started in this very room. So um, when I was a PhD student, just coming towards the end, I actually came to a Darwin lecture in 2004, almost exactly 16 years ago, in this very room given by Vincent Courtier uh, from Paris. Uh, and this was part of the evidence uh, series that the, that the Darwin uh, College had organized. I must admit, I'm slightly, um, slightly worried that we've moved from volcanoes being part of the evidence series to the enigmas series. 
uh, that doesn't sort of strike me that we've, uh, maybe we're going in the wrong direction. I prefer to think of it as part of the cycle of scientific endeavor. But uh, anyway, we've moved from evidence to enigmas. But this was the f one of the first times I'd seen this plot uh, that Vincent um, and others were working on at the time. Um, and what we have on this plot here is the age of extinction events as recorded in the geological record. And then on this axis here, the age of something called volcanic traps, which I will explain in a second. Uh, and the point of Vincent's lecture was this coincidence in time between, the, uh, between these extinction events, they're labeled here, we're gonna come back to some of these, um, and these volcanic trap events that we have here. And I'm gonna talk a bit, a bit more about what volcanic traps are. Um, but, uh, but really what had allowed this progress when he was putting this together and when others were working in this area were, were advances in dating that allow these extinctions to be, um, be dated better um, and then also these trap events to be dated better as well. So I saw this and in many ways I've been kind of working on things related to this in some way or other ever since. So just to give you an illustration of what this means, um, the... Uh, the, the, uh, the one event that you might well have uh, heard about here is the end Cretaceous event. This gets a lot of press. And the reason this gets a lot of press is because of our friends, the dinosaurs, that are very impressive, um, impressive animals indeed and capture the imagination. Um, and it also gets a lot of press because there's been this on-running debate between whether it was the Chicxulub impactor that hitting the earth that killed the dinosaurs or, or whether it was the, the volcanism of the Deccan traps that I, I'll uh, describe in a bit more detail later. And there's also a, a wealth of, uh, of enjoyable cartoons on this. So here's a cartoon of T-Rex killing another dinosaur before it gets killed by a rock hitting it from the volcano, which is, I think, not quite how we think it happened. Um, and here's another of two dinosaurs saying, hey, Arthur, check it out, a shooting star. That's a sure sign of good luck, my friend. Uh, and it really wasn't. Um, and uh, the dinosaurs are no longer with us today. I should also point out this is the first of two emojis you will find in my talk. I asked my daughter for some feedback on my slides, and her one piece of feedback is more, was more emojis. So I managed to get two types of emoji into the talk, and this is the first one. So uh, please, uh, please, please uh, appreciate the feedback that I take from the younger generation. Um, so... As I say, these are these ages of, ages of volcanoes here, but the interesting thing in the geological record is we do not have the same evidence of coincidence between impactors as we go back through these other extinction events back through the geological record, whereas the dating was making the argument that there is a, more than a passing coincident uh, correlation between these different types of events here. So... Flood volcan uh, large igneous provinces or volcanic traps are not your typical type of volcanism. They're quite an extraordinary type of volcanism. And it's a type of volcanism that we as a species have not had to deal with. So this is the most recent example of flood basalts um, on our planet, and that's the Columbia River flood basalt. You can see this kind of car there and this, uh, this, this sort of barn here. So these are, these are just on the Canadian uh, North American border on, on the West Coast. Um, and what you can see is this stack upon the stack, layer upon layer of lava flow uh, uh, over a very, very wide area. And just to give you an idea of the area here, this is the, the Deccan traps that went off at about the same time as the demise of the dinosaurs. And again, you can see this characteristic topography here of layer upon layer of lava flow. Um, and this here gives you a sense of the area that these, these events cover. So this is the subcontinent of India here with the, uh, the, deck, the area covered by the Deccan traps um, shown there. So the Deccan traps, which is about 68 to 60 million years ago, uh, these, these, these provinces are um, characterized by probably about a million cubic kilometers of lava being put out onto the surface of the planet. Now, a million cubic kilometers is quite a hard number to get your head around. So um, I did a few sums, and a cubic kilometer of lava would cover the whole of Cambridge in, I think, about 25 meters of lava. Um, alternatively, it would cover the whole area of Greater London in about 60 centimeters of lava, so you could choose which one you'd like to, you'd like to do. Um, but, of course, I know what's, what you're thinking, because the, um, the, the usual unit of catastrophic area is Wales, so I did do the calculation that it would cover the whole of Wales to about five centimetres. Uh, so, uh, so, so perhaps, perhaps uh, that sort of puts it in some sort of perspective. And, and the volcanic traps put about a million, half a million to a million of these cubic kilometres onto the surface of our planet. And they also pump out enormous quantities of gas. 
Um, so sulfur dioxide, for example, about uh, a million, million tons of sulfur dioxide. And it's complicated in terms of its pulse, the activity, but most of the activity was, is within about a million years. And so I've shown you two examples here, but actually the surface of our planet is absolutely peppered with the, the remnants of these, these large igneous provinces, these volcanic traps. So these blue ones here are showing you the ones that are submarine that came out under the, uh, under the sea there. The, the red ones are the subaerial, the, the ones that erupted onto the continents. Um, and then we've got some more silica-rich uh, traps that I won't talk about so much today. Uh, but I wanted to draw your attention to a few here that we're going to talk about uh, later on. So I've already pointed out the, the Deccan traps here. Uh, but I also wanted to point out the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, CAMP for short, uh, that actually was all together and has been torn apart by tectonic forces. There's now over three continents. And then also this enormous area up in Siberia, the Siberian traps here from about 250 million years ago. Um, and there was a, once that I was lucky enough to fly from London to, to Tokyo and get a window seat in the daytime and it was clear. And I got really, really mesmerized by just flying for what felt like hours and hours and hours over this, uh, these, the, this amazing trap topography, this, this enormous area of basalt that, that, uh, that was put out onto the surface of our planet. So these are, these are not, um, they're, they're not uh, completely rare events, but nor have we seen one in, um, in, in, uh, in terms of our, our, the history of our species, with, this, with the Columbia River being the most recent one. So one of the things I do as a volcanologist is actually uh, try and learn what we can from the volcanoes uh, that we have um, on the planet today. So um, there's a sort of spectrum of volcanic activity. There's some of it that tends to make the news when it impacts on people or, uh, or when it's particularly spectacular in terms of photos. So we've got this, uh, the eruption of Tal here. Um, this, is, um, this is the eruption of Hawaii in 2018. But really, it's all part of a spectrum of activity going from kind of the quiet release of gas that we were talking about at Messiah Volcano, um, or even just uh, no magma at all with, with cracks in the earth. This is Volcano Volcano, so the original volcano just off Sicily, where, where gas is just seeping out. Um, and then we can go right to the other end of the spectrum with things like Mount St. Helens in 1981, this enormous Plinian column, as uh, Mary already described, punching gas up into the stratosphere. And then, as I said, we've got these types of volcanism that we've never experienced, um, either in the human record or certainly not in historic times. I've already talked about volcanic traps. This is Columbia River again, but there's also these very, very large eruptions, sometimes called super eruptions by the press. Um, and this is the Toba caldera here over in Sumatra. And that was the, the last so-called super eruption about 75,000 years ago. And just to give you a sense of scale, that's about 100 kilometers, uh, that lake there, which is actually a nested caldera of craters. So what I, what I try to do in my work is to make measurements of volcanoes at this end of the spectrum, for health and safety reasons, um, and, uh, and, and then think about what, how we might extrapolate up to the type of uh, impacts that we get from these volcanoes possibly the environmental fallout in terms of mass extinctions from things like volcanic trap events. Um, so to do that, let's sort of take a step back and think about what volcanoes actually put out into our environment, into our atmosphere. We've talked about lava flows, and of course there's other types of flow as well, like pyroclastic flows, which are uh, the, uh, the sort of uh, the, 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 the silica uh, equivalent, where you have this sort of almost like a volcanic cloud running down the, the sides of the hills very fast. Um, but of course there's also ash that could go up into the atmosphere, and that can have, um, that can have uh, atmospheric reactivity and uh, effects there. And then a whole cocktail of different gases. So uh, it should be no surprise, given the ubiquity of water in our, on our planet, but water is one of the major constituents of volcanic gases. And it varies a bit, but, uh, but it's one of the major constituents. However, our atmosphere has a lot of water in it anyway, and it's quite used to having variable amounts of water in it in any case. I mean, the atmosphere in, in Cambridge and Oxford today has been very full of water, I can tell you, walking from the station. So we're quite used to variable amounts of water. So the, the water that comes out of volcanoes doesn't tend to have uh, a big impact in terms of the environment of our planet. Second on the list is often carbon dioxide. 
So carbon dioxide in terms of a volcanic eruption like this one, this is an eruption of, of Mount of, of Etna and down in Italy, is actually a very insignificant amount compared to other uh, sources of carbon dioxide to our atmosphere. So every now and again you get the, the, the people who, who would like to believe that uh, carbon dioxide levels in our atmosphere are not controlled by human activity coming and asking us how much carbon dioxide comes out of volcanoes. And it's quite tough to measure for a number of reasons that I won't have time to go into today. But it's uh, even our best sort of maximum estimates are two orders of magnitude, so 100 times less than the, uh, the carbon dioxide that human activities are putting out into the atmosphere. So in, in eruptions that we see today, actually carbon dioxide probably isn't, uh, isn't perturbing the atmosphere too much because of various other things. But you have to remember that when we're thinking about a large igneous province, something that's going on for a million years and really perturbing the planet over that sort of time scale, it could be, uh, it could be a, a forcing there. And then we get into the slightly more reactive gases in the atmosphere. So we get to gases like the sulfur gases, sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide. So these are the gases you might notice if you go to a volcanic area. So if you go to a volcanic area and you smell rotten eggs, uh, that's your hydrogen sulfide there. Uh, if you go to a volcanic environment and you smell something that's a bit more like burnt matches, that's uh, sulfur dioxide like that. And in fact, I was describing these smells in quite a lot of detail on a program for the World Service a couple of years back. And the presenter sort of turned to me and went, are you like a connoisseur of volcanic gases? I said, oh, uh, I never thought of it like that, but I, uh, I, I suppose maybe I am. But uh, unfortunately, I've never been able to calibrate my, my nostrils. I'd love not to have to carry all the equipment up the volcano, just sort of stand there and take a nice deep breath and go, oh, I think that's a sulfur dioxide to hydrogen sulfide ratio of two. But uh, uh, unfortunately, this, uh, this, is, this is not going to happen. Uh, but these, both these gases are important to the atmosphere for reasons I'll come on to. Uh, and then we've got various other um, acidic gases like the hydrogen, um, the hydrogen halides as well. So hydrogen chloride, hydrogen bromide, hydrogen fluoride. Um, and then something I'll come on to at the end, which is about some of the, the metals that we get coming out. And mercury uh, comes out. So in, in many ways, volcanoes put out the periodic table. And so it can have, they can have all sorts of different, uh, different reactions with our atmosphere. And the other component of volcanic plumes is aerosols. So aerosols, this, this very fine, uh, often water-based, uh, often hydrogen, uh, sulfuric acid-based, fine haze. It's called aerosol, very similar to when you do, you sp if you spray uh, an air freshener, you see a haze coming out of it. That's because there's very fine particles in, in that spray there. Um, and different volcanoes uh, can put out these different components in different balances. And in fact, even one volcano can put out different balances between these different components at the same time. So this is uh, a photo taken by Clive Oppenheimer, the 2001 uh, eruption of Mount Etna. And you can see that you've got three really different types of volcanic plumes just in this, this one piece of activity here. You've got this ash-rich plume uh, coming from the fissure eruption uh, down in the southeast. And then you've got the southeast crater that's got a bit of ash in it here. Uh, but not so much. And then the northeast crater over here is just a steam aerosol-rich plume. So even these, 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 at the same time, you can have different balances in this chemical cocktail being put out into, into our atmosphere. And we learn a lot by looking at uh, volcanoes today, and we particularly learn a lot by looking at volcanoes today in the time since the, in, since the satellite era. So what a very important eruption for us as volcanologists was actually before the time that I, uh, before my PhD, but um, people are still studying it, was the eruption of Mount Pinatuba in the Philippines in, in 1991. So this is, uh, this is actually a picture taken a little bit before the cataclysmic eruption, the maximum phase on the 15th of June. Uh, but this 15th of June eruption got a column height up to about 35 kilometers, punched up into our stratosphere um, in this, this Plinian type of eruption. And it put out about five um, cubic kilometers of magma and about 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide. And we think it's something like a, a one in a hundred year event. So um, not, uh, not, not super common, but also not super rare. So that punched up into a stratosphere, so the layer where the, the made famous by studies of ozone and the ozone hole, the, the layer in the, the upper part of, above the, the troposphere. And the really important thing about that is if something gets up into the stratosphere, the stratosphere is stratified and things don't, get to, get, don't tend to get turned over 
um, and, uh, and, and deposited out. Um, but one of the reasons that this was such an important eruption is it was the first such size of eruption in the satellite era and in the space age. So we were really actually able to see the effects, the enigmatic effects of volcanoes in a way that for the, for the very first time. So we could actually um, see what it was doing to, to the atmosphere. So here are some photographs actually taken from the space shuttle. So Earth is down here, and here is the, the, the depths of darkness of space. Um, and you can see some, some shadows here, which are clouds. And this is uh, in 1984, so this is a little clean background atmosphere, if you like. And you can see, you can see the, uh, the sometimes called the thin blue line of our atmosphere here. Um, and then this is a similar photo, so it's taken at sunrise or sunset um, in 1991, just after the eruption. And you can see this weird optical effect here, uh, uh, basically in the, in the stratosphere, which is being caused by the products of the volcano. And we could use satellites to track what was happening with the products of the, of the volcano as well. So this is now a, an instrument that's measuring optical depth. So optical depth is basically a measure of haziness. So you remember I was talking about sort of spraying air freshener and seeing the haze coming out. If you, that rapidly dilutes and you, and you can see through it. So haziness is like fogginess, if you like. So the higher the optical depth you have, the more particles you have in your atmosphere. So it's like a foggy day rather than a clear day. So here is a lovely clear uh, stratosphere here uh, with all dark colours uh, before the volcano goes off. So this is the sort of average, if you like, between 90, the April and May 1991. And then the volcano goes off on the 15th of June, and this is the, the emission site over here in the Philippines. And you can see rapidly that the, uh, the haziness spreads right the way around the belly of the planet. So the Earth is wearing a sort of belt of haze up in its stratosphere. Um, and then we, we, we shoot forward a little bit into 1991, August to September, and now that haze is spreading from the, uh, from the, the north to the south like this. Um, and we can go forward into 93, 94. We can, still, we can see it's dispersing, uh, but we aren't quite back at these background levels. The stratosphere is, is still hazy. And that haze is basically being caused by the sulfur dioxide being put up into the, into the stratosphere, then reacting slowly away to form this sulfuric acid aerosol, this, this hazy particle cloud that's going around the planet. And this had consequences. So this is now, um, again, a, uh, an average temperature map. And this is showing the summer after the eruption. So June, July, and August um, average in 1992. And what we're seeing here is deviations from normal. So if you take a 10-year or um, a multi-decadal average of temperatures at the surface and then compare that year to that, it's showing the anomaly. It's showing the difference. And what you'll notice is that, the, that most of the map here is, is blue. Most of the lower atmosphere was cooler in that year than it would be normally. There's some really interesting features down here that I won't have time to talk about here, which are sort of showing us things about how the different modes of the atmosphere work. But we basically saw a cooling after, after the, the Pinatuba eruption. So it gave us a, it gave us a clue, uh, an insight, really, into how volcanoes can have a, a global effect. Uh, the reason for this is because that haze up in the, in the stratosphere, we know that haze interacts with, with light because that's what's happening. That's why we can't see so far on a foggy day as a clear day. So what that haze in the stratosphere was doing is actually reflecting some of the sun's energy back into space. So if you'd been an alien sitting on Mars or on the moon, the Earth would have just looked that little bit brighter after the Pinatuba eruption as more of the sun's radiation was reflected back into space. So this was a sort of a really, really key example to understand the science behind how, um, how uh, volcanoes can actually um, influence global climate. But one of the big questions about large igneous provinces or volcanic traps is what style of eruption they have. So if we go and look at the deposits, we think that it probably isn't so much like that big Plinian eruption column going up into the stratosphere, uh, as we saw in the, in the Pinatubo case. Probably it's a more sort of persistent type of activity, uh, the sort of activity that's, that's pumping out lots and lots of gas over a very long period of time into the lower atmosphere and only sometimes getting into the upper atmosphere like this. Uh, these deposits are very old, so it can, putting the story of the deposits uh, together can be quite complicated. So it's also really important to go and, um, and study, uh, study these persistently emitting volcanoes as well. So here we are back at Masaya Volcano in Nicaragua. Um, 
And I've already mentioned that Masar is actually a very low relief, so it's quite a, a, a low, it's only about 600 meters in elevation. Um, and so this now is where that lava lake is. This is actually a photo taken from Managua Airport. Um, I was on my, my way home um, after, after field work, and it's at 6.30 in the morning uh, on my birthday. And I was facing the idea of spending most of my birthday in Miami Airport. So, uh, so I was feeling in a fairly grumpy mood. But, uh, but this, uh, th this, this photo was, uh, the, at least there was beautiful weather and a beautiful view of the volcano. So what you can see here is the, this is where that lava lake that we saw earlier is. And you can see this gas plume drifting off downwind from the volcano here. Um, and the issue with Messiah Volcano is that actually there's a lot of high ground downwind from the volcano. And there are communities living in this, in this uh, environment here. So it's a real opportunity for us to, discuss, to, to, to sort of investigate what happens to the chemistry of that plume and what effects that plume has. As, uh, as, it, as, it, as it drifts off downwind towards the Pacific Ocean, which is down over there. Um, but it also has real uh, impacts on the daily lives of these people. Uh, and so that's something also that we, we think very carefully about in terms of uh, what sort of steps uh, people might do to help them. So the actual closest, uh, the closest uh, community is this El Panama community here, which if you could just make it out, just live on this. Th this is an old caldera rim. Uh, an old volcanic crater rim up here, uh, and they're only about two kilometers uh, from the vent. And um, we've, worked, we've worked in this community uh, quite a lot now, and a very poor community in any case, but the volcano hasn't always been degassing. It does not, this, it, it's degassed on and off as far as historical records go. But the latest episode of degassing started in about 1993, so some people moved into this community uh, before the volcano was degassing, and they've really seen their lives change in, uh, in very noticeable ways. So you'll see that the, you know, I showed you some of the pictures of lush forest land that characterizes that area of Nicaragua. Well, the area down, downwind of the volcano is more like this sort of bleached grassland like this. The vegetation has really been changed by the, uh, by the volcano. Um, and Nicaragua's main cash crop here, which is coffee, does not react well to those acidic gases. You can see this, these burn marks on, on the leaves here. Um, and so they've had to adapt and change. And actually, they've changed their agriculture from coffee, which is the main cash crop, to pineapples and dragon fruit, which it actually turns out grow really, really well in, in this environment. But there's, there's other sort of things as well, like their pots and pans all rust really, really quickly. Many of them have breathing difficulties. And in fact, they can't even use nails to hold the the roofs on their houses because the nails rust away, so they're all tied down with rope. So it's a, it's a very poor community, has a lot, of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of other problems as well, like at lack of access to running water. But uh, we actually made a video uh, about this community, and it, include, it included that snippet I showed you of the, of the lava lake at Messiah. Um, and we, we got to the village school, and we brought a massive big screen television up with a generator with the help of the local authorities. Uh, and we played them this video, and they absolutely loved it. They, they watched it three times over. I think they'd have watched it all, 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 all evening if we, uh, if we had been able to stay. But another thing that was very, um, very moving for me was actually many of them have never been into the national park. Many of them have never seen the volcano or looked down and seen where the gas is coming out. It affects them every single day of their lives because it costs $25 to get into the national park. Um, and many of them can't, can't uh, afford that fee. So actually seeing what the volcano looked like was, was something that uh, they, they was absolutely fascinating for them as well. So the other things that we do is also to look at the best analogues we can of, um, of large igneous province type eruptions. So this, is, this was the 2014 to 2015 Holleran eruption, which is much easier to say than I thought the year could. Um, so this is the, uh, another eruption in Iceland. This was actually coming out underneath the, the, the ice cap um, up in Iceland. And this was actually probably one of the most similar types of eruptions to, um, to, to uh, volcanic traps to large igneous provinces. These sort of fissure eruptions here with lava flows flowing away, large glass clouds moving away like that, some fire fountaining going on over here. Um, but nonetheless, very, very much smaller scales. So it was only about a cubic kilometer of magma that came out, and it only lasted for about six months um, and put out about six to eight million tons of sulfur dioxide. 
Uh, but as a, as a team, actually, in collaboration with people like Anya Schmidt here in Cambridge, we've been looking at some of the f effects of this and looking at some of the effects in terms of model using atmospheric transport models, but also using satellites to really understand how this is interacting with the atmosphere more broadly. And of course, yet again, this, this answers another question um, in terms of how do you make a volcanic plume more, more spectacular? You put the northern lights in the background. Uh, I'd like to make the point these two phenomena are not intimately connected in the way that the, the lightning was before. I um, Actually, it's, uh, it would be an absolute dream of mine to actually see the northern lights at all. And I think the idea of seeing the northern lights with a volcano as well, I, uh, I, I think I'd take months to recover from that level of excitement. So, uh, so unfortunately, I didn't get to see this. Uh, but these, these types of eruptions are really, really important. So that's one string to the way that we're trying to understand what's going on here. But let's go back to the thinking about the fossil record a bit more, thinking about the, the geological record um, and trying to understand uh, more what we can learn, and what we can measure today to help us to interpret the geological record. So I, only sh I already showed you this plot that Van Sol put up in this room about 16 years ago. Um, but actually, there's quite a lot of detail that he didn't really tease out in this plot. So he sort of put this age of extinctions here an age of volcanic traps on, on, this, uh, on this axis here. And he's kind of simplified it, as you do, in order to make a point. He's making the point about this coincidence in time that the, the imp ever-improved dating is making. But actually, all these events here are rather different. And I'll just give you a sort of uh, illustration of that, is that we, we have something in the geological record we call the Big Five mass extinction events. So three of these are members of the Big Five mass extinction events here. But actually then, uh, a couple of them are only minor mass extinction events. Must have such an inferiority complex. But um, <laughs> you're only a minor mass extinction event. Um, and, uh, and then others are just environmental change events recorded in the record with things like, uh, things like carbon isotope extensions that show that the carbon cycle of the planet has really changed. So, so although he's, he's, he's comparing these to volcanic traps, actually it's not a one-to-one -one relationship because all these things are slightly different and slightly different in terms... And actually, there's a real richness in that that can allow us to study a bit more and understand a bit more about these events. But just to give you a flavour of some of the work that we're doing, I'm just going to focus in on these, these major mass extinction events um, and uh, draw, out some, uh, draw out some thoughts that we've been having on those or use them to illustrate that. So I've actually now taken a slightly longer... Vincent also only took about 300 million years of Earth history. So I'm also going to take a slightly longer perspective as well, uh, go back another 600 million years. And I mean, it's, it's still sort of very small fry in terms of the age of the Earth. So the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old, which kind of gives me another sense of vertigo when I come to think about it. And it's another thing that as a, an Earth scientist, it's very, very uh, a big challenge to get your head around thinking about that sort of enigmatic time scale. So when I started doing my PhD, I did chemistry as an undergraduate, so I was learning it all afresh. Um, in one of my lectures, one of my lecturers put his arm out and said, so if, if this is the 4.5 billion years ago, uh, this is the, the foundation of the Earth, how much of your arm, if this is present day, so you're illustrating your geological time scale, do you think human beings have been on the planet for? And um, I sort of scratched my head and thought, maybe we'd get to a couple of knuckles. Um, but uh, actually, if you just take a nail file and, uh, and draw it once across your fingers, that's, that's the kind of proportion that human, human beings have been on the face of this planet. So we're just the nail dust of planet Earth. So it's, it's always worth remembering that. Um, so if we take the geological record a bit further back here, um, it, does, it does capture basically the record of life. And what we've got on this axis here is the number of taxonomic families. So basically species diversity, if you like, on a, a, a fairly arbitrary scale. Uh, and what you can see is that we're seeing these, these variations and these are the mass extinction events where you get these big drops here. Uh, and what I've done is spread this out to give the big five. So we've got the Endor Division, the Late Devonian, the End Permian, the End Triassic, and the End Cretaceous when the dinosaurs died that we've already talked about. Um, and Vincent, we already saw from his plot, had the Deccan Traps with the End Cretaceous, the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province with the End Triassic, and then the Siberian Traps with the End Permian. But actually, there are these two other events that go back deeper into time. Um, and there's some evidence that there was the Voloi traps, which are also in Siberia, overprinted a bit by the Siberian traps in some ways, that coincided with this late Devonian mass extinction here. 
but we have no evidence for what happened, what, what trigger there might have been for the end or division. And one reason for that might be that there was a different trigger, it wasn't a volcano, or volcanoes weren't actually involved with that. Or the other, um, the other, the other uh, reason for that might be that we've lost the volcanic deposits. We might have lost them through the process of subduction, or they might have just been crushed by tectonic forces, or simply weathered away, or overprinted by another large igneous province even particularly. So this is a big enigma, but this is going back this deep, far in the uh, geological record. It's very, very enigmatic. I should, of course, put out the second emoji of the talk, just in case you missed that. This is the volcano emoji, which uh, I think they've done a very fine job, of, uh, job on that. Um, so, actually, this, this idea of looking at species diversity, uh, to, to link this back to Darwin, uh, came out of work around the same time of Darwin. So, Darwin himself wasn't a huge fan of the fossil record. I think, he, I think the quote goes that he likened it to trying to read a story uh, which, from a few pages of a book that had been torn out. So he wasn't a massive fan of the, uh, the fossil record. There were a lot of um, controversies about it at the time in which he was working. Uh, but uh, John Phillips, who uh, is actually spent some time in Oxford, and this is actually a bust of him in the Oxford University Natural History Museum, which is just around the corner from my office, um, produced one of the first plots of species diversity. So the, the time axis has flipped here. So we're now, this is present day, and this is deep back in time. Uh, species diversity over the geological period, essentially recorded in British rocks. And what you can see is that he did manage to identify the M. Permian mass extinction here and the M. Cretaceous mass extinction here. Um, and he said, and as we don't write scientific papers like we used to, I can tell you, I was, this, book, this whole book is uh, actually online. You can read it. Uh, 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 it's uh, online from one of the US libraries, I think. But on the opposite page to this figure, it just, we have found by this mode of inquiry that the abundance of the forms of life in the sea has been very unequal at different periods, and that race has followed race so as to match the words of the poet, and then he goes into Latin poetry. Uh, and I'm not, a, I'm not very good at Latin, but I did a Google Translate, and I believe this was, was a bit better than that. I believe this translates as some people wax, others wane. In a brief interval, the generations replace each other, and like the racers transmit from hand to hand the torch of life. And this is apparently from uh, Lucretius. Uh, so I've never actually managed to quote poetry. I was very pleased that uh, Mary quoted some poetry in the introduction. I've never quoted poetry in my scientific papers, which remains a, a source of disappointment. But I did manage to quote Wordsworth in a reply to reviewers once. So I'm very, very proud of that. Um, but actually, you know, in terms of, uh, of John Phillips's actual... Uh, handing of the torch from generation to generation. He had what uh, was described on one of my sources as a rather Oxford end, which makes me very worried. He had a very fine dinner at All Souls College, um, in very illustrious company apparently, then tripped over a carpet and fell down the stairs and died. So uh, I don't know whether that really qualifies as, uh, as transmitting from hand to hand the torch of life. But... Uh, but uh, but I suppose you've got to go some way. But, uh, so I shall bear that in mind after the very fine dinner I will be enjoying at Darwin tonight, not to trip over, avoid carpets and stairs. There we go, note to self. Um, but these ideas have been, uh, have been around for a while. So I want to zoom in on some work that we've done recently on the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province and the end Triassic mass, mass extinction um, and show you perhaps some of the advances that we can make by making measurements in volcanoes today. Uh, this also brings me a story of probably my least successful piece of public engagement or uh, media engagement uh, during my career, where we, we published this paper that I'll show you some of the results from uh, on the end Triassic mass extinction. And I was uh, asked to go on Radio 5 Live with Adrian Charles and talk about it. We had a five minute slot. Um, and so he, I was on the phone and phoned up and he says, oh, so, so yes, yeah, so you've written a paper about the mass extinction at the end Triassic. And I said, yes, we've shown evidence for volcanoes having a role. And he's like, that's great. What does it have to do with T-Rex? <laughs> and I said, oh, oh, well, no, t this is the end Triassic. T-Rex was the end Cretaceous, which is uh, over 100 million years later. That's fine, yeah, so, but what does it have to do with T-Rex? Well, no, it doesn't really have very much to do with T-Rex, actually. Uh, T-Rex really wasn't around uh, during the end Triassic mass extinction. Do you think there's a way this could have cleared the ecosystem to make way for T-Rex? <laughs> yes, okay, I suppose it could have done, yes. Thank you very much, Professor Mather. <laughs> so, um, 
and on to the news. Um, so, so I'm not quite sure I got my point across. I felt I'd been a little bit uh, battered by the, the journalist there. But anyway, we did manage to at least mention the N-Triassic in, in that interview. Um, but uh, just to sort of home in on that, so this, the N-Triassic world looked like this. If you remember, I showed you that the deposits from the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province that have now been torn apart into three separate continents and basically are present in northern Africa, northern South America, and along the, uh, the east of, uh, of North America here. So we lost about 76% 70, of all species about 201 million years ago. Um, and the hard-hit groups are some of these, these guys here, but you'll notice not T-Rex, because T-Rex was not around. I can't say it often enough. Um, so we, we, we had a, we had a, a large area of, of large igneous province going off. So it's worth pausing for a minute to think about some of the challenges that we have when we want to actually study these events back in the geological record. And so one of them is the way that we record the different uh, parts of the story. So actually, we, we're really lucky in the UK. We have some fantastic, um, fantastic uh, outcrops of key rocks from the geological timescale. And the end Triassic is no exception. So this is a, a section through the mass extinction event, uh, which is just near Lyme Regis. So if you go down to Lyme Regis uh, and take a right, uh, somewhere by the traffic lights there, there's the mass extinction. But no, if you take a right and, and wander down the coastline here, we take, the, we take the undergraduates there. And you can basically walk up. So you can go, go, go around the first point, and then you can actually walk up through the end Triassic period. And you get to the fantastic Ammonite, uh, pavements that are, are very, very famous. And what you're work, walking through here is the pre, you'll see, if you look at, if you were able to look at the rocks in a lot of detail, you'd see a lovely diverse ecosystem system in the pre-extinction level, sort of somewhere around here. And then you go through the extinction event and you see that the fossils disappear from the record and they're being deposited and then eventually preserved. And then a new fossils emerge after the extinction event and then a, a new ecosystem will emerge as well. And actually, these ammonites are part of this recovery phase here. Um, so this is one way that you can basically look at what's going on in the biological realm in terms of how we go about doing geology. And of course, in, in this case, you could actually walk up through, through the, the, uh, the extinction here. Um, but sometimes people drill down through the rocks as well to get really nice, clean cores. So this is the end Triassic uh, mass extinction here. We actually have... Fantastic rocks as well in Somerset and places like that around the country uh, showing this succession. We also have the end Permian uh, mass extinction recorded in our rocks. These rocks are roughly uh, approximately on the Devon, uh, the Devon Dorset border. Uh, one thing I didn't realize when I went there first that actually it's a nudist beach. So, uh, so that was a slight surprise when we went there on a summer's day to study a mass extinction. Uh, but uh, <laughs> science takes you in very funny directions sometimes. Uh, but this is the way that we record the sedimentary, what's going on in the biological realm. Um, and the reason I wanted to talk about the, tri the end Triassic is actually we have an interesting situation with the end Triassic because sometimes we're looking at these sedimentary columns here and we're looking at what's going on in the biological realm. And we're going off to a different part of the planet and picking up a, a rock, say, from Siberia for India. And then we're, we're dating that and we're trying to match things up. But actually, in the end Triassic, we're really fortunate because we, we actually have these lava flows often interleaved with the very sedimentary columns that we're trying to study. So the Triassic is actually the best case scenario in many ways in terms of trying to understand the relationship between the volcanism uh, and the biology. So just to give you an example here, I've got this is, a, a, this is going deeper, deeper down through a column here in age of million years. And we've got three sedimentary cores here. So from Newark, these, these are uh, the marks on the map here. Argana, which is now in, in Morocco, and Fundi, which is up in Canada. And these are just some pictures here from Fundi. So you can see here, these are the basalts. These are the layers from the large igneous province overlying the sedimentary layers here. Here's another one here with these red sedimentary and then these, these basalts here. So we've actually got, this is this number one, this north mountain basalt here. This is actually interleaving with the, the, the sedimentary rocks. And if you look at the sedimentary rocks, you can tie together where the mass extinction is. You can find the horizon in the rocks here. And you can see immediately that you've got some complexity here. We've got lava flows that are going off, uh, going on. There's evidence for them before the mass extinction, some on the mass extinction, and then some after the mass extinction. 
But of course, these are just very localized. This is the particular core. It's not necessarily what's going global on globally over the whole scale of this massive, large igneous province. But you can pick up rocks from these, these different lava flows, and you can look at little crystals, these little, these little capsules within them. And you, look, you can look for things that decay, radioactive decay, which are captured with the crystals. And you can use those to date the rocks. But what you end up with is something like this, with massive, this is, each of these is the, the uncertainty on an individual crystal. And then you do some statistics to, to tighten that up in terms of the, the lava flow as a whole. But what you can see is that you end up with these, these large, there's this scale here is a million years. So you've, you've still got something that's got an error bar on it of sort of 0.03 million years, which is quite a big, it's a very big error bar when you're trying to match, actually sort of tightly match things up in terms of cause and effect. Uh, and what's going on on the global scale within this province. So this is really challenging. So this is where some measurements that we've we started off making for completely different reasons in volcanoes come in. So we, we went basically, uh, one of the things that we're interested in, what sort of fingerprints of gases are coming out of volcanoes, and what sort of fingerprints of things are coming out of volcanoes. Um, and here I am, I'm going to sort of, uh, here I am back uh, out in the field on Mount Etna, uh, making some measurements, looking for those volcanic fingerprints. Um, and Mary me mentioned health and safety earlier. This, this is a photo that I, I did show my mother. I don't show her all my photos from the field, but I did show her this one. She's very pleased with this photo because I'm wearing my hard hat and my gas mask and a sun hat underneath. So I've come really, really prepared. In fact, I'm even wearing two hats at the same time. So, uh, so she's actually quite pleased with us, even though she does not so much like the active volcano in the background. Um, so I went to give a talk recently at the Lapworth Museum in, in Birmingham, and it advertised my talk. Uh, they found a photo from their archive, and this was the photo that they used from their archive, which I think is from Vesuvius or Mount Etna, and shows this wonderful picture of a Victorian lady uh, going up uh, one of these volcanoes in, in this amazing dress. So, uh, so, so I, I don't quite know why they chose this photo to advertise my lecture. I sort of had this... Uh, that's a slight quandary about how they saw me. Into, uh, I'm not sure I've ever worn a dress like this, but if I do, I will go up a volcano and, uh, and, get, a, and get a photo. She must have really, really ruined her frock. I mean, it's a shame. But, um, but anyway, I just thought I'd put that in to show, the, uh, show some of the different approaches to field equipment that people have taken over the years. Um, so what we're, what we're measuring when we're up at the top of Etna there is actually the element mercury. And I measured this element uh, earlier on when I was talking about what comes out of volcanoes. And the reason we were measuring it is because mercury is toxic. We were interested in how much comes out of volcanoes because that informs the background flux. You know, man, mankind's activity like artisanal gold mining, for example, puts out mercury into the environment. And we were actually uh, working on that because we were interested in how much the natural flux was from volcanoes. Um, and volcanoes are actually a, 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 a major natural source of mercury, which is really important for what we come on to next. But mercury is uh, a really unusual metal. I don't know if any of you, I, one of the things that used to be a highlight of any physics lesson for me was if someone broke one of the mercury thermometers, uh, which we're no longer allow, apparently allowed to have in schools or universities. But all these beads of this amazing stuff would just run across the floor and then the teacher would get the sulfide out and start chasing them around. Um, and, uh, and, and of course it was very toxic and so not a good idea but it's still an amazing substance and it's this, this only metal that's actually liquid uh, at room temperature but it is very very toxic and it bioaccumulates so pregnant women for example are told not to eat too much tuna because it bioaccumulates polar environments are very susceptible to it and in fact it's um, controlled now by the Minamata Convention and it's in the background air all around us so if you take a deep breath now into your lungs you just took in a couple of nanograms of mercury uh, in that. So it comes out as a gas of volcanoes, so it's widely dispersed in the atmosphere. So we're going up Etna, down here in Sicily, to make a measurement of mercury. This is the view from our, our house, our, where we're staying. You can see the fume coming out. And then we drive up to the top of the track, and here we all are packing up our packs and then going off in a sort of chain gang up, up into the volcanic mist up here with our colleagues from INGV. Uh, here we are struggling along. This is my colleague, Andrew. He looks like he's carrying a vanity case, but it's not. It's actually a very high-tech piece of equipment, and he won't hear otherwise. Um, and uh, here we are scrambling around the edge to set the equipment up. 
Uh, and as you can see, some of our number succumbed to the volcano fumes and had a nap. Uh, here we are doing a procedure that says on the instruction manual, find a clean lab. Uh, we didn't have a clean lab, so we were just making do at the top of the volcano. There's the, the, the Andrew's vanity case again. Um, and uh, sometimes it's, it's, very, it's very nice. Actually, other times it's very unpleasant at the top of Etna. Um, this, this is, this, the clouds have come in. Actually, this is not just a normal cloud. This is a, uh, um, it's, a it's an acidic cloud. So it's got things like hydrogen fluoride in it that actually etch your glasses and dissolve cotton in your clothes. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a really unpleasant sort of environment and it's very cold as well. But these are the measurements we're making. So we're actually measuring all sorts of different species. Um, my parents were always very impressed by how much duct tape we use. So uh, I think my parents thought I was doing a PhD in duct tape for a while. But, uh, but we've got like a, a glass, a glass uh, piece for a denuder here for measuring white, one type of gaseous mercury. And the little gold traps here as well for more, more mercury. And we have all these different equipment that allows us to measure how much mercury is coming out of volcanoes. So we've got a much better idea. So you might ask, what's that got to do, got to do with the end Triassic? Um, but actually, the interesting thing is because the volcano is going off here, we can go and look in the sediments. So you remember I said that we, were, we had our igneous rocks and then we had our sediments. And in many cases, these were completely separate and hard to mesh together because of those error bars on the time scale. What we can now do is go and actually look at the sediments themselves for the fingerprint of that volcanic activity, for that mercury that came out of those lava flows. So if we think about like the flows coming out here, I'm going to talk about some results from this Kujok column, this, the sedimentary column at B in Austria here. And so what we, could do, what we do is basically uh, take measurements of mercury. We have to do some normalization as well. And you can find the extinction event. This is the end Triassic extinction, the stem stands for. In the, uh, in the sediments themselves, you can look for those changes in biology. And then you can actually match that up with this mercury that we believe comes from the volcano in order to understand what the volcanic activity on the province scale, so on this, this whole area like this, is, is actually doing. Because the idea is, is that if you have mercury being emitted anywhere in this province, it ought to be long enough in the atmosphere that it can end up deposited in places like this sediment core just here. And because in the end Triassic, one of the things that's particularly excited me about this period, we actually have the lava flows interleaving with the sediments themselves. We can even work out where this spike of mercury is coming from. So we have this lower atlas formation that we know from the sediment cores in Morocco actually happens around the, the extinction itself. So we have this puff of mercury, and this mercury has been released in my, in my lab back in Oxford. And this is a pic picture of the lava flow back in, in, in Morocco. I find it kind of really awesome that this, this, volcan this, this volcanism here, 200 million years ago, coughed out some mercury, got stored in Austria, and then got to be released in a little puff in my lab back in Oxford, so 200 million years uh, later on. And we can look for evidence of pulses and things like that. And of course, this proxy also means that we might be able to go and hunt for what sort of volcanic activity was going on in the Endor Division and whether that played any role. Although there are also a bunch of enigmas, a bunch of unknowns in terms of how the mercury cycle w worked this far back in time. So I've come to the end. I've come to the end of the journey that I wanted to take you on today. Um, and we come back to the beginning, which is sort of me staring into the mouth of a volcano, or in this case, actually standing by a lava flow on Etna. And I really hope that what I've convinced you is that by peering into volcanoes, and thinking about the, uh, the mysteries and enigmas that they present. You can get insights not, into, not only into the, the mystery of what, what our planet's doing beneath our feet uh, as we stand here today, but also about how we've, how we've come to be here, how the planet has changed and evolved in order to allow us to be sitting in this lecture theatre wondering about enigmas themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, thank you very much indeed, Tamsin. I'm going to end with a quote from Pliny just before he perished Fortune favours the brave. <laughs> I think the message is volcanologists need to be brave, but certainly also very careful and cautious. Uh, now, I saw in 
see in today's news that there's a report of a massive explosion, the biggest ever seen in the universe. It's not a volcanic eruption that we've missed. Apparently, the blast has come from a supermassive black hole 390 million light years away and left a crater so big it could hold 15 Milky Ways. All I can think is that it's a really good thing that astronomers, unlike volcanologists, don't do field work, because <laughs> just imagine the sort of risk assessments they'd have to do. So next week, the final lecturer in this series on enigmas will be the explorer, Dr. Albert Yumin Lin, who's going to speak on archaeological mysteries. And following that, uh, I will, re will reveal the theme and the speakers for the 2021 Darwin College Lectures. So, I hope to see you next week. But to end, let's just thank Tamsin for her talk this evening. Thank you.